Praise God. Well, good morning to you all, wherever you're watching, whether it's good afternoon or good evening. Just welcome, and it's great to have you all with us. And happy Valentine's Day. Love is in the air. Everywhere I look around. Don't worry, I'm not going to start breaking out into song. You're quite safe. Now, allow me to just to bring you a few interesting facts. Did you know that when a couple lovingly gaze into one another's eyes, that their heart rates become synchronized? How cool is that? And did you know that falling in love is kind of like snorting a line of grade A cocaine because both experiences affect the brain in a similar manner, triggering the sensation of euphoria? Who knew? And did you know that by hugging a loved one, it releases a natural painkiller in the body to the point where some have reported that their headaches have completely disappeared as the result of a loving embrace. And so the next time you have a headache, you know what to do. And then finally, did you know that we are not the only species that seeks to be in a faithful and a monogamous relationship But there are also certain animals like wolves and swans, gibbons and termites that seek the same. And so when the Bible calls us, it probably tells us to to go and get wisdom from Proverbs 6.6 where it says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Amen. Isn't all of that fascinating? Because it just goes to show God's good design, even when it comes down to the topic of love. And so, on this Valentine's Day, within the context of love, let us briefly look at the topic of love, sex, and marriage. Because the world has so much to say about these topics, and the church rarely does. And so, I've entitled this morning's message as simply fighting temptations and pursuing godliness in our relationships. If you have your Bible with you, then please come with me to the book of 1 Corinthians and we're going to read from chapter 7 and the first seven verses. And it says this. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote... It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body But the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control." Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now, at the start of the pandemic, as countries began to lock down, Every business and organization faced the huge challenge of moving everything online literally overnight. And as people found themselves in isolation, the enemy also took advantage of this by, through the medium of pornography. As I am told, that major porn sites were literally giving away free subscriptions in order to entice the vulnerable to self-medicate throughout this entire period. But at the same time, I am so glad 
that the church stepped up and flooded the internet with devotional services and the beloved Zoom meeting. And in one, one uh, Sunday morning, you may remember that Zoom crashed because of the amount of traffic that was going through it. And I, for one, am so glad that it did because it just shows the church was taking territory even within the cyber world. Amen. Now, the depravity of society isn't something new, but it has been around for millennia. I mean, Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us that there is nothing new under the sun. And even though we may have our sin cities around the world, places like Las Vegas and others, the ancient world also had their very own city of sin, and it was called Corinth, and it was a place where anything went. Now, Corinth, it was, a, it was famous for the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of sex and fertility. And in her temple... There were a thousand prostitutes because worship to this idol, it involved having sexual relations with one of the temple prostitutes. And as you can imagine, this heathen religion garnered many converts as many souls were seduced by their own lusts. In fact, it was a given in the ancient Greco-Roman world that prostitutes were for the sake of pleasure. Co um, concubines were for the sake of daily cohabitation and wives were for the sake of bearing legitimate children. And so, due to the decay of morality, some of the believers in the Corinthian church, they wanted nothing to do with sex whatsoever and they considered it to be of the devil. But in their zeal, they got it twisted and they began to assert that celibacy was the way forward. That it carried with it a much greater and a much higher level of spirituality. Thus giving birth to spiritual pride and snobbery. And so... Due to the moral decadence of sex on tap with whoever and wherever. And due to the overreaction of those who were advocating for celibacy, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes to bring correction and guidance. And he writes some powerful and timeless truths that are still relevant for us today. Praise God. Now, life in the ancient world was much like ours is today in the sense of sexual temptation was everywhere. I mean, back in my day, we used to have huge billboards with scantily clad models draped all over them to contend with. But today, because of the rise and the advancement of technology, we are now able to access some of the most explicit material there is with just a few clicks of a mouse or a few taps on the screen. True? And so, the effect that porn is having on the brain is just devastating. Because the brain is getting rewired to feel more pleasure from a pixelated image on a screen as opposed to the real thing. And so, it is to that effect with all the temptations that surround us that Paul gives some godly advice to live by. And in verse 3, he says... The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Now, we may blush when it comes to the topic of sexual intimacy, but God doesn't, because after all, it is his idea. And within the confines of marriage, Sex is good and 
proper, wholesome, and a beautiful thing. Can I get an amen? You see, it is all those things and more. Because within marriage of a husband and a wife, there is love and trust and honor and not forgetting the blessedness of God just as he designed it. In fact, studies have shown that those in committed marriages have the better sex as opposed to those who bounce from relationship to relationship. And so... Let us celebrate godly marriages and let us model them for the next generation. Because if we don't, then they may just receive their counsel from other sources like Hollywood or Love Island or some other sexually charged program and that will not bode very well. And so... For the sake of our witness to the world and for the sake of the next generation, let us strengthen our marriages to the glory of God. And if you're married, then let us make love and not war. You have my permission, not that you need it. Now, in Greek mythology... There's a story of a man called Odysseus who was an adventurer. And one day, Odysseus set out on this voyage because he had heard about these stories of these singing sirens and he wanted to hear them for himself. Now, sirens were these beautiful female creatures that were absolutely stunning to look at And their song was even more alluring. However, they lived on this dangerous island where if a ship got too close, it ran the risk of being grounded and destroyed because of these hidden rocks that lay underneath. And as these ships were destroyed and went down, these beauties with stunning voices would just laugh. Now, Odysseus was a determined young man and he wanted to hear these sirens. And so he instructs his crew to tie him to the mast of the ship and to sail as close as they could without grounding the boat just so that he could hear their song. And the crew were instructed to put cotton wool into their ears so that they couldn't hear anything. The ship sails and it moves closer to the sirens. Odysseus hears them and is now spellbound. He begins to struggle. His struggle turns to rage and he orders his crew to go even closer. But thankfully, they couldn't hear him. Eventually, The ship sails past and Odysseus, exhausted from his struggle and depleted of all energy, lies there still strapped to the mast. Now, we may think that that's what it looks like to follow Jesus in a world full of sexual temptation. But it's not. But rather... It is more like another story in Greek myth, this time of a man called Orpheus. And one day, as Orpheus sails past the island where the sirens are, as he hears their song, he takes out his harp and he begins to play an even better song. And instead of him being drawn to the sirens and wrecking his ship, the sirens swim out to hear him. You see, in Jesus, we have a much better song than the world can ever offer us. 
And as we begin to play his song and recount his word and rejoice in his so great a salvation, we break the spell of any worldly trance. And so if you ever feel the temptation to do something that you ought not, do not run away from God, but run to God because in him there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures that are infinitely greater than all the fleeting pleasures of sin and the world. Amen. And the great thing is that God knows our plight and he knows our weaknesses. Thus, he provides a helpmate in the form of a wife or a husband. Praise God. Paul, he presses this point even further. And he says, husband, your body is no longer yours, but it belongs to your wife. And wife, your body is no longer yours, but it belongs to your husband. Because in holy matrimony, you became one flesh. I mean, isn't that what a couple declare on their wedding day as they exchange rings? As in, I receive this ring as a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honor you. With all that I am, I give to you. And with all that I have, I share with you within the love of God. Amen. Now, let me give you a practical scenario. And for the sake of illustration and for argument, let's just say that the husband comes home one day and he wants to romance his wife. But his wife, she's not interested. She would rather eat a whole bar of chocolate and go to bed. What are the couple to do? Should the husband demand sex and bash his wife with 1 Corinthians 7, telling her that her body no longer belongs to her, but to him? Answer, no. Because that would be tantamount, tantamount to abuse, not only of the spouse, but also of the scriptures. And that should never be the case. So what are a couple to do? Well, they should both operate from a spirit of love. And what that looks like for the husband is because he loves his wife and he doesn't want to pressure her, he chooses to exercise one of the fruits of the spirit, namely that of self-control. And he decides to try again another day because that's what love does as for the wife even though she doesn't feel like it but out of love for her husband she decides to give herself sacrificially because again that's what love does and so as Dr. Piper states each one is trying to outdo the other in sacrificial love, thus becoming more Christ-like even in their marriage, as in selfless as opposed to being selfish. Amen. You see, the counsel of Paul is do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement and for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You see, 
It is okay to hit the pause button on sex for a limited time for the purposes of seeking God. But once that time has elapsed, then let the loving resume. Amen. Now, we have spoken much about sex and marriage, but Paul also offers a word for singles, and he affirms them, and he says, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. In other words, love and marriage is not the gold standard for everyone. And the term good here, it can also be translated as honorable. And so, a person choosing to be single isn't abnormal and it isn't weird, but it is perfectly honorable and acceptable before the Lord. And later on in the chapter, Paul will give his reasons why. And so, when we come across a single brother or a sister in the Lord, let us not assume or pressure them into seeking a spouse, unless, of course, we know that that is what they want. Then it's okay to have that conversation, but to do so with sensitivity and love. Amen? And so, in summary, living in a highly sexualized world like Corinth or Reading or wherever you're tuning in from today and this morning, where temptation is just everywhere and it is rife. If you are single and you're content with your singleness, then that's great. It's a good thing and it is honorable. However, if you're single and it's your desire to be married, then I will say, seek the Lord for your future spouse and bathe it and cover it in prayer. And as you wait for Mr. or Mrs. Right, do not settle for Mr. or Mrs. Right now, but be a gift for your future spouse. Amen. If you're married, then let your marriage display the goodness of God in your lives and live every day as if it be Valentine's Day. Now, speaking of Valentine's, did you know that St. Valentine was a priest who was imprisoned and then later executed on the 14th of February, AD 269. All because he helped per the persecuted church and he married Christian couples. And legend has it that while he was in prison, he prayed for his jailer's daughter and her blindness was healed. And on the day of his execution, he left her a note signed, your Valentine. Isn't that amazing? Now, as great as St. Valentine was, there is another who showed us an infinitely greater level of love. And his love was never revealed through Cupid's arrow, but rather it was it was demonstrated to us through a wooden cross. And it was there that the Father set his seal of love upon all who would come to him. And he says, you are mine and I am yours. Because after all, he is the great lover of our soul. And Jesus, as Esther pointed out earlier on, is our true Valentine. Praise God. And as we come to know and discover his love, we discover that it is so pure, so amazing, and so divine that it demands my soul, my life, and my all, as Isaac Watts so wonderfully put it. 
And if you do not know this love of the Savior this morning, then I invite you to simply put your trust in him this morning because he will never do you any wrong and he will never lead you astray. But you will be right there close to his heart forever and ever. And if that resonates with you, then please drop us a message, send us an email, get in touch, and we would love to connect with you. I'm going to invite the worship team, if they would, wouldn't mind just returning. And so, on this Valentine's Day, as well as rejoicing in our spouse, let us rejoice in the great lover of our soul, in our Savior. Because He is the only one that could ever bring us true joy, completeness and fulfillment and satisfaction and all of those things. It is all founded and rooted in Him. And He is also the one who gives us the grace and the power to overcome temptations and to fulfill and to pursue godliness in our relationships. And so, again, if you don't know this Savior, then I want to encourage you to come to know Him and you will find and discover a love that is just wonderfully mind-blowing and it's a love that carries on and it's not a fickle love of just goosebumps and just feeling our the hairs on the back of our necks standing up but it is a love that is divine that is strong that is powerful and it's a love that is constantly there commanded towards us if that's you then hit the live prayer button send us a message We would love to speak with you. But let's just close as before I hand over to the team. Let's just pray. Father, we want to thank you for your great, so great a salvation. We thank you, Jesus, for the love that was shed abroad at the cross of Calvary. That, Father, before, Lord God, you saw us, Father. Lord, you saw us and you knew us, Lord God, way back, Father, from eternity past. And in order to have us and pursue us in eternity future, God, you stepped down into your creation, God. And you became sin for us, Lord God, that we, that we may receive your righteousness. And Father, how you have set forth and poured out and lavished your love upon each one of our hearts and our souls. That God, it has been done. It is completed at the cross. And all we need to do, Father, is to receive that love that flows from Calvary's cross. So God, this morning, I pray that we will know this love, Lord God, that you shared before us. That, Father, that we love you because you first loved us. So God, we pray that, Lord, that you will just pour out more of your love, Lord God. For, Father, couples out there, Lord, strengthen them, we pray. Father, those who are looking, Lord, to be, Lord, joined with their future spouse, we pray, God, that you will prepare them to be a gift right now, Lord, before they meet their future spouse, that they may have a marriage to the glory of God. And Father, we pray for those who are content in their singleness, that, Lord, you will strengthen them. And Father, strengthen each one of us against the temptations that we find in this world. That, God, that we will live for you and we will pursue godliness in all of our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.